I tell you a lie? I took it everywhere. I took it to NBC, ABC, Fox, you name it. Every network in the world, and they all turned it down and said it was too weird, too disgusting. Don't ever come back. <laughs> so finally we took it to Nickelodeon, and they said, well, it, yeah, it's too disgusting, but we kind of like some disgusting stuff, and uh, they went for it. Hey, what is up, you guys? It's Dustin, and I'm back with another video. And in this video, I want to talk about more things that are coming out about Nickelodeon. Now, if you've seen Quiet on Set, you know just how particularly gross some of these people can be in the crimes that they've been convicted of. And at one point, they all worked at Nickelodeon. Well, in this video, I want to cover another person that worked for Nickelodeon that has a horrible past. And if you were wondering, it's about Ren and Stimpy and one of the creators of that show. If you were creeped out by Dan Schneider and everything that you've seen on Quiet on Set, you're not going to like this one. So if you want to see how much worse Nickelodeon can get, stay tuned to this video. So if you're like me and every other millennial questioning every bit of your childhood and the things that we were allowed to watch on TV, probably not going to like this one because I'm going to be talking about Ren and Stimpy. Now I myself, I used to watch Ren and Stimpy all the time. I kind of thought as a kid that this wasn't right because I really didn't understand everything that was going on in this cartoon. And now in hindsight, I realized that it really wasn't for me as a child and it should have never been on a children's TV network, much like many other things that have been discussed and quiet on set. Joy. <laughs> well, there was a TikTok that was served to me the other night, and it was about Ren and Stimpy and one of the creators. And by the end of this TikTok, my flabber was gasted. So in today's video, I want to read an old BuzzFeed article that I found while I was doing research. As always, I'm going to link this article in the description box down below if you'd like to read along or if you'd like to read it for yourself. So let's just get into it. So the tagline of this article is drawing the line, the disturbing secret behind an iconic cartoon underage essay. Robin Bird and Katie Rice were teenage Ren and Stimpy fans who wanted to make cartoons. They say they were preyed upon by the creator of the show, John Chris Felucci, who admitted to having a 16-year-old girlfriend when he approached BuzzFeed News. John Kay, who you may remember is the uh, the head of Spumco and uh, creator of such cartoons as Ren and Stimpy, probably one of the greatest cartoons of our childhood and s screwed a lot of us up in, in just the best ways. Uh, John, Thank you for coming in. Thanks it's, for having me, Kale. Automatically, like automatically, we know that this is like back in the early 90s. This was around like 1992, 93, maybe 1994. And I know that a lot of people think differently. They say it's a different time, but this was never okay. Why would a grown man want anything to do with a 16 year old if they're not a predator? Period, point blank, end of story. If you're dating someone 16 and you're a fully grown man or you wait for someone to turn 18, you're a predator, period. Robin Bird thought her plan was working when the letter from her hero arrived in the mail. It was 1994 and the 13 year old had sent the creator of the Ren and Stimpy show a video of herself talking about her drawings and the animation career she envisioned. She thought if she could get the attention of the studio behind the hit Nickelodeon show, she might get a job there someday. John Chris Felucci's effusive letter, Bird said, seemed like the first step toward her dream. He pursued women all the time. He was always pursuing underage girls. Um, he was always pursuing women who were who worked for him or near him in the studio. Um, but Katie and I were the ones that he was the most dogged about. He just, you know, he we were like the ones that got away, and he just. <laughs> would not let it go for the longest time. So here we have someone dangling a carrot, and we've all talked about that before, with James Charles and the potential misuse of power and influence. She could hardly believe she would responded, I had built up these characters and this mythos of Ren and Stimpy in my head. Bird now 37 told BuzzFeed News, it was exciting. I also want to point out that this came out in March of 2018, so this is before all of the stuff with Dan Schneider and all the people that are being so vocal now actually talking about what their experience was when they worked at Nickelodeon on set. Apparently with Nickelodeon, you didn't even have to be on set. You could just mail something in and they'd send you something back to prey on you. Weird. Soon she said she began receiving boxes of toys and art supplies from a 39-year-old Chris Felucci, better known as John Kay. So we have a 13-year-old being sent toys and all kinds of things from a 39-year-old man. A th that's somebody that's older than me. I'm 36 years old. We have someone that is almost 40, like pushing, pushing 40, sending things to a teenager, 
giving them a proposition, making them think that maybe they could work at Nickelodeon one day. Like, I get that Dan Schneider's bad and he's always going to be a bad guy, but to me, this is just as bad, if not worse. He helped her get her AOL account, through which he convinced her he could help her become a great artist. Rumor. He visited her at the trailer park where she lived in Tucson, Arizona. I thought I was still his cute little friend, she said. And then when she was still in the 11th grade, he flew her to Los Angeles to show her his studios and talk to her about her future. She said that on the same trip in a room with a sliding glass door that led to his pool, he touched her through her pajamas as she lay frozen on a blanket he placed on the floor. She was 16. Electric chair. Where were her parents? Like, seriously, no shit. Where were her parents and why was she allowed to fly or drive? I don't know how she got there. They're not saying in this article. Why was she allowed to travel from Arizona to California as a 16-year-old with her parents not being there? Why would you even let your child be put in that position? That is a compromising position. In the summer of 1997, before her senior year of high school, he flew her to Los Angeles again, where Bird had an internship at Spumco. Chris Fellucci's studio, and lived with him as his 16-year-old girlfriend and intern. After finishing her senior year in Tucson, the tiny dark-haired girl moved in with Chris Fellucci permanently at age 17. She told herself that Chris Fellucci was helping to launch her career. In the end, she fled animation to get away from him. No one, uh, I mean, I briefly broke up with him for like four months during that time, um, but it wasn't because of that even. It was, I was just tired of his shit, like as a human being. <laughs> but it wasn't like... I realized that it was wrong. I mean, it was just so normalized by everyone who was around me. He, his friends, some of his pervy friends are just such enablers. And they're into little girls too. And they just made it seem normal. They just made it seem like, oh, it's John and his little girlfriend. They're all pervy. And um, they were, you know, his enablers. They especially would, you know, convince me to stay with him. And <clears throat> like try to be my friend so that I felt better about the whole situation. Since October, a national reckoning with SA and harassment has not only failed dozens of prominent men, but also caused allegations made in the past to resurface, as they should if you're being a creep. In some ways, the old transgressions are the most uncomfortable. They implicate not just the alleged abusers, but everyone who knew about the stories and chose to overlook them. Boom, there it is. Although the SA allegations against Chris Fellucci have never been made public before, his relationship with Bird has been an open secret within animation. So open that a girl he had been dating since she was 15 years old was referenced briefly in a book about the history of Ren and Stimpy. Tony Mora, an art director at Warner Bros, and Gabe Swar, a producer at Warner Bros, worked alongside Bird at Spumco. The male artist said stories of how Chris Fellucci essayed and harassed female artists, including teenage girls, were known through the industry. It's always been there, Mora said. Moreover, Chris Fellucci made his fixation on teenage girls plainly obvious in his art, even as he worked on animated projects for the likes of Cartoon Network, Fox Kids, and Adult Swim. In an interview with Howard Stern in the mid-90s, the radio host talked about him and a character in the comic book anthology. The cartoonist was then promoting Stern called Sody Pop, a hot chick with big cans and nice legs. Chris Fellucci responded with a smile. She's underage, too. Can we just talk about that clip with Howard Stern for a minute? I know that I've talked about him previously in my Richard Simmons video, and there was a lot of people in my comments saying that I just didn't get his humor. I'm not really too sure what the comedic value is of someone referencing someone being underage and then finding that attractive. I just think that's weird. And even Robin in that clip, she was just going right along with it and co-signing everything they were saying. And I'm so glad I did not pre-read this article because they're hitting everything that I'm thinking right now. Like, all of these people that knew this guy was a creep, that knew he was doing these things, that knew he had a girlfriend that was like 16 or 17 years old, they all need to be called out as well because this is gross because if you know something and you don't say something, you're just as guilty as the people perpetrating that crime against people. And yet, Chris Felucci, 62, continues to be widely celebrated as a pioneer within the male-dominated field of animation. Creators of shows including SpongeBob SquarePants, Adventure Time, and Rick and Morty have cited Ren and Stimpy as an influence. After Nickelodeon fired the perpetually behind schedule artist from Ren and Stimpy in 1990, 
1992. He became an early proponent of art and shows made just for the internet. His output has slowed down, but he enjoys a living legend stature that promoted 3,562 people to fund a Kickstarter campaign for his short Cans Without Labels, which he screened at a prestigious animation film festival in 2016. Hey folks, I'm John Kay. Uh, you know the Ren and Snippy guy? Listen, I got a cartoon I'm dying to make, and I'd love to do it just directly for you without having to go through a whole bunch of TV executive rigmarole. So this Kickstarter thing is really great. It's a way for uh, you know guys like me to make this stuff directly for you. He made art for Miley Cyrus's 2014 Banger Store. He animated two credit sequences on The Simpsons, the most recent in 2015. that woman get beer until the publication of this story his portrait hung on the wall at nickelodeon are we even really surprised that nickelodeon had a picture of this man up until this article went out it seems like nickelodeon definitely had a knack for picking out these kinds of people i mean look at dan schneider look at brian peck and michael handy nickelodeon had zero issues with hiring people that were very very bad people on chris Velucci's behalf an attorney responded to a detailed list of allegations in this story with the following statement i really can't wait to see what this says because i just just know it's going to say something about that being a different time and how things are interpreted differently and they're going to make a lot of excuses. Let's see what they have to say. The 90s were a time of mental and emotional fragility for Mr. Chris Felusi, especially after losing Ren and Stimpy, his most prized creation. For a brief time, 25 years ago, he had a 16-year-old girlfriend. Okay, like, the fact that he can just boldly admit this now because it's been so long is incredibly bold because he's basically saying, yes, I did this. I'm admitting to this. Like, what are you going to do about it? He knows we can't do anything about it now. Over the years, John struggled with what were eventually diagnosed mental illnesses in 2008. To the point for nearly three decades, he relied primarily on alcohol to self-medicate. Since that time, he has worked feverishly on his mental health issues and has been successful in stabilizing his life over the last decade. This achievement has allowed John the opportunity to grow and mature in ways he'd never had a chance at before. That's not a mental illness. Like, you don't date someone that is 13 or send them gifts in the mail, like toys, and flirt with them and eventually fly them out to where you live and then inappropriately touch them. That's not mental illness. Like, it probably is a mental illness, but we can't use that as an excuse. Like, you still have control of your actions and your faculties. Like, you don't just get to go around touching people. And you also don't get to go around making people feel uncomfortable. And just so we're crystal clear, this is not something that he's going to get away with by saying this is a mental health issue or this is an alcohol issue or any of that I want you to look at how young this girl was we know that she's 13 in this picture that I'm about to show you I want you to see her face alongside his because he's not going to use mental health as an excuse for what he did he's just not While Bird felt deeply alone when she left animation, she later realized she hadn't been the only underage girl Chris Felucci groomed for a relationship. In 2008, long after she last saw Chris Felucci, Bird reconnected with an old internet friend, the artist Katie Rice. Chris Felucci introduced them through AOL in the mid-90s, when they were still children, telling them he'd hire them both at Spumco someday. Groomer. Let that sink in. While they were still children, in an AOL either email or instant message, he was telling these girls and grooming them in a way to make them believe that he was going to give them a job at Spumco. Although Chris Felucci never had a physical sexual relationship with Rice, he began hitting on her when she was a minor, she said. Behavior that ranged from writing her flirty letters, I bet you'll be up to no good, just like me, he wrote in 1996, to while she was on the phone. In 2000, when Rice was 18 and trying to break into animation, Chris Felucci offered her a job. Once she started working for him, Rice said he persistently sexually harassed her. I know a lot of people struggle with the art versus artist thing. Old letters, emails, and transcripts of AOL conversations between the women and Chris Felucci back up many of their claims. They each have witnesses to parts of their stories, yet both women worried they sounded crazy for years. They chose to keep their experiences private because coming forward didn't seem like it was worth the risk. Rice feared retribution from many supporters. Neither woman thought they'd be taken seriously. And we see that a lot. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier as far as the power imbalance. When it comes to people in positions of power, they have the ability to ruin you. They have the ability to make you look crazy. They can take you to court. They can hold you up in court. There's a lot of fear that goes into not speaking out. And that's why it usually takes years upon years for people to finally come forward. So I'm glad they finally did. Now they believe the world has changed. Bird feels the time has come for Chris Felucci to be held accountable. Particularly, she said, after the police 
Prince told her in December that Chris Felucci's alleged crimes against her were too old to investigate. He shouldn't be able to get away with that, she said. I really don't understand why if there's concrete evidence and proof to back up these claims, why there's a statute of limitations on things like this. Truthfully, I think he should be prosecuted. And while Bird teaches philosophy in undergraduate writing classes, Rice still works in animation and regularly encounters people asking her what it was like to work for a legend. It made her hesitant to criticize him as if it would be her fault for tainting his work. But sitting in a Burbank restaurant, she said, I know a lot of people struggle with the art versus artist thing, and I get it. Like, I love Rosemary's Baby. But would I watch another movie that he made knowing what I know now, she said, referring to the multiple allegations against filmmaker Roman Polanski? I would say no. I don't want to watch it. I don't want any part of that. There's nice people you can hire. There's nice people who can make things. There's nice people who can make cartoons. They're just as good. So think about this. This person still works in the industry of animation and she has people continually telling her and asking her what it was like to work with a legend. That's like pouring salt in an open wound. But then you couple that with the fact that this man has still got away with this and admitted to it publicly. It probably makes her feel sick to her stomach. Rice wanted to be an artist from the time she was in the fourth grade. In the summer before fifth grade, when she started watching the original Nicktoons, Doug, Rugrats, and Ren and Stimpy, the tween decided to become a cartoonist. Her parents were skeptical. Her mother told BuzzFeed that she was worried her daughter was being unrealistic. So when Rice wrote to Chris Felucci when she was around 14, and they began corresponding over AOL, Rice said it was a source of validation for her and her family. A powerful man who had recently been nominated for an Emmy Award saw that she had potential. And that's just so sad to me. The fact that her parents were there and they were aware that she was talking and communicating with this man across AOL and they thought that that was okay like what what like I need the parents of some of these people that had been through this stuff to take some accountability here I really really do they continued chatting online and on the phone into her sophomore year of high school and Chris Felucci's messages made her feel special in an AOL conversation he told her not to copy and send to her friends he said I want to you and squeeze you. And I'm crazy about you, Katie. He asked her, do I ever make you tingle? In an email she printed and saved from a few days after she turned 15, the 41-year-old man wrote, I'm thinking about you very hard right now, and I have a little tickle in my chest. Now, 36, Rice looks at these old pages with some of the compliments underlined in purple gel pen and cringes. I think this 40-year-old man is hitting on me, Rice wrote in her diary, but he's never perverted. He is also very nice. He gives me a lot of drawing tips. And this is so sad to me that she didn't even realize what was going on in this moment. She was being groomed and she was in a weird space where she couldn't really say anything because that could jeopardize her job or possible opportunities in the future. And that's what makes all of this so much more sinister and so sick. At the time, she didn't see the harm. I think this 40-year-old man is hitting on me, she wrote in a diary entry from between December 1995 and March 1996, saying her friend agreed with her. Speaking to BuzzFeed News, the friend recalled having this conversation and that she thought Chris Felucci was hitting on Rice. Rice then, 14, continued in her diary, but he's never provided he is also very nice. He gives me a lot of drawing tips. Rice and Chris Felucci met a few times in Los Angeles, and they kept talking after she moved with her parents from California to Lake Tahoe in 1996 when she was entering 10th grade at age 14. They never had physical contact, but when Rice lived in Nevada, she remembers several late night phone calls during which Chris Felucci said, repeat after me, John's slides in my What? His pronunciation of the word while he on the other end of the line, she refused. Rice, who was naive about sex, said she didn't realize what he was doing at first, until all of a sudden, she did. Christine Knuckles, a high school friend of Rice, who later worked at Spumco, said Rice told her about the and when they were classmates. This is so sick. So let's recount everything that we've talked about up until this point. So we have this man mailing things to minors, writing things to minors, chatting with minors in AOL chat rooms, instant messages, and emails. We have him talking on the phone to children, literal children, teenagers, on the phone getting his rocks off. Why is this man not under a prison? The conversation left Rice shaken, but she trusted him. Lonely in her new school in Nevada, she viewed him as her only friend. He attended her 15th birthday party, which he later confirmed on a DVD extra for the 2000 2003 Ren and Stimpy reboot. I was at her 15th party. We'll tell you that backstory a little bit later, he said with a grin. She was devastated when he abruptly stopped talking to her in early 1997. And I want you guys to take a really good look at this picture that's in this article here. Like, this is wild to me. You can tell that this is a whole child and that is an old man. That's an old man. <laughs> That same winter, Chris Felucci flew out to visit Bird, then a high school junior at home in Arizona. They had 
for the first time at a nearby hotel, she said, and put into motion a series of decisions that would reshape the rest of her teenage years. She moved in with Chris Felusi for the summer and interned at Spumco, then completed her senior year at a private school in Arizona, and he would cover the tuition. He told her he could give her an animation career in Los Angeles when she graduated. She and her mother believed him. Hey, this is Katie Rice. She is one of the young artists I was telling you about who sought me out because she grew up watching Ren and Stimpy, right? So, um, uh, Ren and Stimpy has a lot of uh, specialists on it. We have people who draw manly, we have people who draw uh, sensitive, we have people who draw sexy girls. Katie is the princess of sexy girl artists. Now I gotta tell you a little history because um, all through the 80s, when I was working at Hanna-Barbera and Filmation and all these uh, studios, I always wanted to draw sexy girls into the cartoons. But since the networks were all run by, uh, by dykes, they wouldn't let you because they thought it was offensive to women to draw girls cute like Katie here. So um, it frustrated me and all the other artists that like to draw sexy girls. It's so wild to me that parents will literally sacrifice their kids. They will offer their kids up to these predators and let them just take them all because they think that they're going to have a better life. All because they think that this money is so important. You know what's really important? Not traumatizing your kids. Being there for your kids. Not putting your kids in bad situations with men like Chris Felusi. I really do hope that her parents are ashamed of this. I really do. So when the young artist and writer moved in with Chris Felusi in the summer of 1997, as an intern, she was making copies keeping art organized and learning how to be an animator. I made my dream come true, Bird said. That's why I sent the tape when I was 13. Everything in California was new and exciting, including to some degree her boyfriend. I believed as a 16-year-old dating him, oh, the world's against us. It shouldn't be wrong for him to date me. We're cool and rebellious because we're breaking the rules of society, Bird told BuzzFeed News. She said he told her their 25-year age difference was romantic. No, it's not. You're just a child predator. In a letter she wrote to herself during the internship, her method of working out her feelings at the time, she frets about all the way she's alienating her 41-year-old boyfriend with her nagging and her guilt inflicting. She says Chris Felusi doesn't care about her emotional well-being. He may adore my mind and ideas, but he does not have regard for my feelings as I do his, she wrote. The artist shared an office with Swar, who was in his early 20s at the time, remembers her frequently crying. And the article says, I was like, who's that little girl? So all of these people were aware of what was going on and they kind of just let it happen. Despite the volatility, this seemed like a break to her. Chris Felusi was teaching her a trade. And over the course of more than 600 blog posts reviewed by BuzzFeed News, Chris Felusi portrays himself as a uniquely qualified molder of young minds. That sounds eerily similar to what Dan Schneider was saying. But anyway, it's the same image he presented to Bird and Rice and to many of the fans, mostly men in their 20s, who he had at Spumco in the 1990s and early 2000s. They were inexperienced young people who Mora and Swore said believed deeply in the art Spumco was making. It was a small studio that usually had between 10 and 30 artists at a time. Most of them convinced they were doing something defiant by working there. Derek J. Wyatt, an artist who started working at Spumco in 1999, told BuzzFeed News the studio was a cult personality centered on Chris Felusi. After Bird graduated from high school at 17 in 1998, Chris Felusi hired her to work at Spumco and she moved back into his Los Angeles home. And then this article goes on to talk about things like cheese pizza and other things that I'm not too comfortable talking about. So I'm going to link it in the description box down below. But with that said, you guys, let me know your thoughts and opinions on this down below. If you made it this far in this video, leave me the cop car emoji because I think this guy should be under a prison. The fact that there's actively people out here that stand this person and look up to this person is incredibly alarming to me. But with all that said, I hope you guys all have an amazing day and I will see you all in my next video. Bye guys.